For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the case of Margaret Anderson from Green Bay, Wisconsin. This is a massive case which is horrific in its depravity. It contains so many different factors, murder, abuse, alleged hitmen, criminals on the run, biker gangs, and assistance from America's most wanted. I was shocked to find relatively little information online and indeed on YouTube about this murder. At around 3am on Tuesday the 27th of December 1983, Deborah Smits was heading home after completing her shift at Procter & Gamble's East River Mill in Green Bay. As she drove near the entrance of the Packerland Packing Company on Lime Kiln Road, she saw a woman lying on the ground. Deborah stopped the car and cautiously approached the woman who was lying on her left side. She called out but got no response and noticed that the woman was bleeding. Deborah quickly got back into her car and rushed to the packing plant's guardhouse for help. The security guard told her that he had just called the emergency services after a truck driver had told him that they had seen a woman staggering, then collapse in the same area. Deborah rushed back to the woman and gently rolled her onto her back. The woman had a large neck wound, which, as Deborah would later describe, had blood coming out like a fountain of water. The police arrived at 3.11am. The woman was still alive. She was thrashing her arms, her mouth open, as though trying to call for help. But due to the gaping neck wound, she could not make a sound. At first, the police had no clue as to the woman's identity. An autopsy was performed and the coroner concluded that the woman had died from shock caused by blood loss from her neck wound. This fatal blow, approximately 8 inches in length, had been inflicted with such force that the woman's spine could be seen. It cut through her windpipe and at least one jugular vein. The coroner established that whilst the woman could not have survived this wound, it may have taken her up to 30 minutes to bleed to death. In addition, the woman had many, many other injuries. Every part of her body was covered in bruises and cuts. Her upper front teeth were loose, her nose and skull were fractured, and her face was swollen and bruised. She had four broken ribs, bruises that implied that she was either bound or whipped. A bone in her neck was broken, and there were several linear bruises on her thigh, believed to have been caused by her being hit with a pull cue. Splinters of wood were found in one of the breasts, which were believed to have come from a pool cue with which she was hit with such force that the cue broke. A pool ball was found lodged inside one of her orifices. Whilst there were obvious signs of sexual abuse, no semen was found on the woman. The police circulated a sketch of the woman together with a description of the clothing that she had been wearing at the time of her death. A grey fake fur jacket, a red jumper, and brown corduroy trousers. The woman was 5 foot 6 inches tall, weighed 110 pounds, and had shoulder length brown hair. She was thought to be in her late 20s or early 30s. The police received three anonymous tips stating that the woman could be Margaret Anderson. The police then contacted the woman's son, 16 year old Bobby Anderson. He had been staying with his father, Robert who was Margaret's ex-husband, the two men were both unaware that Margaret was missing. Robert was called to identify the body of his ex-wife. He still had a close relationship with her, despite their divorce. Due to the level of damage inflicted to the woman's face, he struggled to do so, but by 5.25pm on Wednesday the 28th of December, it was confirmed that the body did indeed belong to 35-year-old Margaret Anderson. Margaret was born on the 6th of October 1948 in Sacco, a small American town around 50 miles south of the Canadian border. She was the youngest of five children, and when Margaret was nine years old, the family moved to Malta in Montana, where Margaret spent the remainder of her childhood. Margaret and Robert married young, and when she was 17, they moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin. They had one child together, Bobby. Margaret was described by her mother as an independent, active woman who liked horseback riding and bowling. She was also artistic and enjoyed crafts including painting, knitting and woodwork. By the late 1970s, Margaret and Robert's marriage began to deteriorate, with Margaret's behaviour possibly changing around this time. 
She had several different jobs, and when working in local bars, her drinking increased. She got to know several members of the Drifters Motorcycle Club, and some of her friends say that she became quite erratic during this period. Even though she and Robert separated and subsequently divorced in 1981, the pair remained close. Living just a few doors apart, they even spent time together over the Christmas of 1983, just a day or two before Margaret's death. While suspicion often falls to the spouse or ex-spouse in such cases, Robert was not considered to be a suspect in his ex-wife's murder. By Thursday the 29th of December, the police confirmed that they were investigating a number of suspects with Deputy Police Chief Richard Rice stating that the people who are out at night, every night, are different from ordinary day people. We know who is out there. A lot could be suspects. As the investigation continued, the police began to uncover a clearer picture of what had happened on that night of the 26th and the early hours of the 27th of December. It was established that Margaret had been on a date with Terry Weasel Apfel on the evening before her murder. They had gone to the cinema, then to a bar for drinks, before ending up at the Back 40 Tavern in Bodart Street. This was a known biker hangout for both the DC Eagles Motorcycle Club and the Drifters Motorcycle Gang. The police were interested in four men who had been present. On the 3rd of January 1984, it was reported that the Green Bay authorities had issued a first-degree murder warrant for the arrest of 23-year-old Randolph Gargoyle Whiting. Also wanted by the authorities on an unspecified probation violation but linked to the murder was 27-year-old Mark A.D. Hinton. Both men were bikers and DC Eagles members who lived in the Green Bay area. The police stated that they believed that Randolph and Mark had fled in a light-coloured 1973 Chevrolet wagon. They also warned that both men had knives and should be considered extremely dangerous. Randolph was already on probation for a battery incident, during which he had beaten a nurse who had caught him in bed with a hospital patient. On the same day that the arrest warrant was issued, Mark surrendered to the police, but Randolph remained at large. The police were also looking for a third man, whose identity was not released at that stage. This was in connection with the crime, although no specific arrest warrant was issued. A fourth man, again unidentified, was in protective custody and had provided the authorities with information about the crime. As the search for Randolph continued, the police provided the identity of the other man who they were searching for, 30-year-old Dennis Stumpner, who was being sought as a material witness of the crime. Just under three weeks after the arrest warrant had been issued, the press reported that Randolph had sent a three-page letter to the authorities via an attorney stating that he was innocent and willing to surrender. He claimed that he was being framed and believed his life was in danger, and as such would only turn himself in if four conditions were met. The first condition was that Dennis and Mark were innocent and must be released from any charges, holds or warrants that are or would be charged against them in the future. The second was that if he went to trial, it would not be held in Green Bay or nearby Appleton. The third condition was that his arrest warrant be lifted for 48 hours so that he could turn himself in without fear of being killed. And the fourth and final request was that the news media of his choice could be present for his surrender to ensure his safety. These requests could obviously not be fully met and Randolph once again went silent. The search for him and Dennis went on, whilst Mark continued to be questioned on both this and unrelated matters, and the fourth man remained in protective custody. On the 24th of January, it was reported in the Green Bay Press Gazette that Margaret's sister-in-law, Lola Koppel, had claimed that Margaret's family had hired a hitman to track down her killers, stating that, you can call him a private investigator, I'd call him a hitman. Lola and Margaret's brother David were upset that the police had not yet caught Randolph and Dennis. She went on to say that they wouldn't be offering a reward as they wouldn't give 25000 to have the police get him. I want them tortured. We hired someone to get them. 
it might cost us that. However, Lola later said that she didn't want to use the term hitman as that could get the family into trouble. The Green Bay authorities dismissed these claims as grief and emotion speaking. By February, the identity of the fourth man was made known. 27-year-old Mark Lukensmeyer, the owner of the Back 40 Tavern, had been released from protective custody at his own request. Later, a second letter was sent to the authorities from Randolph, this time through his family, where he said that he was innocent, but could not return until the killer or killers had been apprehended. Around the same time, Mark Hinton's punishment for his misdemeanour offence had been completed, so without enough evidence to link him to the murder, he became a free man. Whilst the police knew of the four people involved in Margaret's murder, two were on the run, one had been released from protective custody, and the other could not be charged due to lack of evidence. The case was becoming increasingly frustrating for them. Another letter was sent by Randolph, again setting out the conditions for his surrender. In doing so, he believed he could collect some reward money which had been offered to help solve the crime, and use this money to fund his defence. However, it was a chance spotting on the 30th of August 1984 that would ultimately lead to his capture. Despite dyeing his hair and shaving his beard, Randolph was identified by his distinctive tattoos and captured near Antigo, around 90 miles from Green Bay. He was arrested without incident alongside three others who were accused of harbouring and aiding a felon. Bail was set at $150,000 with a hearing scheduled for the 7th of September where it was confirmed that Randolph would stand trial for murder. He pled innocent to the charges. During this hearing, both Mark Lukensmeyer and Mark Hinton testified, contradicting each other's stories and their own previous statements, each playing down their role in the events of the 26th of December and blaming others. Whilst waiting for the case to go to trial, Randolph asked for permission to marry his girlfriend, Victoria Chamberlain, at the Brown County Jail. Victoria was one of those who had been arrested for helping Randolph hide from the police. At 10am on the 30th of September 1984, the pair were married in a civil ceremony at the jail. There was strict security during the wedding, and it was not followed by a conjugal visit. Victoria, who had known Randolph for less than a year when the murder happened, and was pregnant with his child, would later say that she married him in part because of her pregnancy, and also because of pressure from her fellow motorcycle gang members, who hoped it would prevent her from testifying against Randolph. The pair were divorced within a few months, and Victoria went into hiding to remove herself from the biker world. In an unrelated incident, Randolph's 49-year-old mother had an accident whilst lighting her stove with kerosene. She had burns over 80% of her body and was rushed to hospital. Randolph was granted permission for a brief visit on the 10th of December 1984 and she died in the early hours of the following day. As Randolph prepared to go to trial, the search for Dennis continued, now assisted by the FBI. The trial began on the 11th of March 1985 with very tight security due to the threats that had previously been made. Although there were around 15 to 20 people in the bar on the night of the murder, many would not talk to the authorities for fear of retribution or simply because they would not break gang code. Mark Lukensmeyer refused to testify or repeat his previous claims implicating Randolph for the murder. He invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination around 20 times and contradicted his earlier statement on multiple points. Nevertheless, the events of Margaret's murder had been pieced together by the prosecution. On the 26th of December, Margaret had been on a date with Terry Weasel Apfel after a movie they headed to a bar where they consumed a relatively large amount of alcohol. Following this, they went to the Back 40 Tavern, where Margaret got into an argument with some of the women from the Drifters motorcycle gang. What started out as name-calling soon descended into violence, with several of the women punching, kicking and scratching Margaret before someone hit her with a barstool. 
After this, Terry was told by the bar owner, Mark Lukensmeyer, to get Margaret out of his bar. Terry took her out to his car, but the couple soon became embroiled in an argument, during which Margaret slapped Terry. Furious, he pulled her out of the car by her hair and proceeded to kick her while she was on the ground. At the same time, the bar was closing and four men came out of the bar. The bar owner, Mark Lukensmeyer, and DC Eagles members, Randolph Whiting, Mark Hinton, and Dennis Stumpner. As Terry finished beating Margaret, he shoved her across the alleyway to the men saying, you guys can have her, I'm through with her, before leaving in his car. The four men who had been drinking all day began beating Margaret. As Margaret called for help, the bartender, Chris Shavik, shouted at the men to stop. She stated that it sounded like Margaret's bones were cracking. Mark Lukensmeyer shouted at Chris to leave and, fearing her own safety, she did just that. She was scared of what would happen to her if she stayed. Picking Margaret up, the four men took her back into the bar where they continued to drink and stripped Margaret naked. They continued to abuse and beat Margaret while she was naked and lying helpless on the pool table in the bar. When they had finished, the men instructed Margaret to get dressed and all five of them got into Mark Lukensmeyer's car. They drove to the Packerland Packing Company on Lime Kiln Road and when they arrived, at least one of the men took Margaret out of the car and walked her towards a manure pit which was surrounded by low concrete walls. At this point, Margaret's throat was slashed and she was dumped onto the manure pit to die. Desperate to survive, she managed to drag herself nearer to the road where she was found but lost her fight for life. Randolph's defence team conceded that he was present on the night in question but that he was not responsible for Margaret's murder. They attempted to pin the blame on Mark Lukensmeyer who had previously been helping the authorities arguing that Mark Lukensmeyer was far more involved in the crime than he was actually making out. The defence rested its case without calling a witness, claiming that the prosecution had been unable to present one iota of evidence that Randolph was guilty of murder and that there was no physical evidence which could prove his guilt. However, the prosecution pointed out that the law allowed the jury to return a guilty verdict if they were convinced that Randolph had been substantially involved in the crime. They did not need to be certain that it was him who had inflicted the fatal blow. And after just two hours of deliberation, the eight men and four women of the jury did just that. Randolph was convicted of first degree murder whereupon he was immediately sentenced to life in prison. Following the successful conviction of Randolph Whiting, the prosecution went after the other men involved. Mark Hinton was charged with aiding and abetting kidnapping, first degree sexual assault and perjury. Mark Lukensmeyer, who originally had an immunity agreement but failed to live up to the terms of it, was charged with aiding and abetting a kidnapping and perjury. The district attorney, Peter Nays, said that the people who played games at Randolph's trial this time will be the defendants. Mark Hinton pleaded innocent to all charges. His trial was due to start on the 9th of September 1985, but it was delayed for a day after he sustained minor injuries from trying to escape from a police car after tampering with its lock. On the 14th of September, he was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Mark Lukensmeyer also claimed to be innocent. He too was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Whilst the search continued for Dennis Stumpner, details of the crime was featured on America's Most Wanted, leading to numerous tips being received. More than 200 tips in total, including three from Golden, Colorado. On the 29th of June 1988, Dennis was captured by the FBI at a horse farm in Golden, where he had been working as a handyman under the name of Roger Weisner for the previous three years. Dennis was charged with being party to a crime of aggravated battery in connection with the murder, being party to a crime of kidnapping and being party to a crime of first degree sexual assault. He claimed to be innocent by reason of mental disease of defect. The case went to trial in October 1988 
and a jury deliberated for less than an hour before finding him guilty of all charges. In December 1988, he too was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Terry Apfel, Margaret's date that evening, who admitted to brutally beating her that night outside the bar, was never prosecuted in connection with the case. After five years, the case finally drew to a close, although the full story of who actually did what on the night of the murder may never truly be known. Despite the long sentences handed down, all four of the men have now been released from prison. Mark Hinton was paroled in the summer of 2007, and Mark Lukensmayer was paroled less than a year later. Dennis Stumpner was paroled in 2011, and in January 2020, Randolph, who claimed to have found religion in 1995, was also released. And if that isn't terrifying enough, I leave you today with the words of Mark Hinton during the trial of Randolph Whiting. There was little unusual about the beating and sexual molestation of Margaret Anderson after she insulted members of a motorcycle gang. Not at that time, not in that bar. That kind of thing just happens. Psst. A judge awarded Margaret's mother $8 million in damages, despite the judge stating that, due to the life expectancy of the defendants, is such that the opportunity to collect is non-existent. That concludes today's case. Please let me know your comments down below. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel. Thanks for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye.